Today we're continuing our message series, Life Lessons. And in this series, we've been looking at the book of James and learning how to put our faith into action in practical ways. This morning, my message is entitled, Tame Your Tongue. Now, the importance of the tongue lies in the words in which we, with which we speak. Our words can be spoken audibly, or they may actually be written down, and others may read or hear them that way. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And so this verse in Proverbs tells us about two different kinds of people and the result of their tongues. The first person is a foolish person. He speaks rash. He speaks reckless words. And these words are destructive in their effect. They're like sword thrusts. They injure and hurt those who hear them. The second person, on the other hand, is a wise person. And the effect of their words is quite different. Rather than hurting other people with their words, their words bring healing. And so we begin to see in this verse the power of words, both for good and for evil. Words are very powerful because they convey ideas and they communicate thoughts between different people. Now God himself shows us the power of words in the Bible, which is the very word of God. God's Word is God communicating His truth to us from the all-powerful Creator God, and He does it through words in the written form. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so in this verse, God's Word is likened to a sword, but this sword is not one that causes damage or brings destruction, but God's Word is able to separate the intents of our heart. God's Word is able to make things clear. God's Word is able to bring conviction to us, to teach us the difference between right and wrong. Jesus said in John fifteen seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And so Jesus instructed us to let his words abide inside of us. That is that we are to believe them. We are to live by them. We are to know them. And it will change our hearts. The words of Jesus will change our hearts to reflect the very heart of God. And when that happens, we can ask whatever we wish in prayer, and God's going to answer our prayers. Why? Because the words of Jesus have changed our hearts and have changed our desires. Ephesians 4.15 puts it this way, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. And so our words should be the words of the wise. Our words should communicate God's truth, but do it with God's love as well. Truth spoken in love will be encouraging. Truth spoken in love will be uplifting. It will bring healing. And Jesus said that one day we're going to have to give an account for every word that we have spoken. That is the importance and the power of words. Let's watch a video which, about our words which is simply called Your Words.
believers, our words have great power either to build people up or to tear them down. And so today we're going to talk about taming our tongues, taking control of our tongues with God's help so that we can use our words constructively for God's purposes. So let's get started with James chapter 3. The first point that we're going to be looking at is talking about how to control our speech. James begins in verse 1 and says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we teach those, for we know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And so the third chapter of James is, is primarily about how we should use our words. And James begins by addressing teachers in the church, leaders in the church. And a teacher or a pastor in a church uses words to teach groups of people primarily about God's word. Often people desire to be teachers because they, they want to be recognized as, as leaders. But James warns. James warns that the words of those who teach will be judged with greater strictness than the words of those who are not teachers. Now, why is that? It was because the words of a teacher that teaches false things is going to impact more, many more people than the words of a person who is not a teacher and does not reach or influence that many people at a time. The church in the time of James and the church today has many false teachers. People who are teaching things incorrect and destructive things that are not biblical. And so the church must be careful. We must be careful who we allow to teach and we must be careful who we listen to teach us. James goes on to say in verse 2, For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says... He is a perfect man able to bridle his whole body. And so now James moves on from those who aspire to be teachers in the church to all the believers in the church. And he says, we all sin and stumble in many different ways. There is no one who is perfect. And then James makes the amazing statement that if someone does not sin in their speech, then they would not sin at all. They would be a perfect person. And so... If we can learn to control our speech, we will be able to exercise godly self-control in the rest of our lives. On the other hand, if we cannot control our speech, then the rest of our lives will be out of control as well. And so our tongues and our speech are incredibly important. James goes on to give us two illustrations about the power of the tongue. He says in verse 3, if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. And so a bit in the mouth of a horse is just a few inches long, but yet in the hands of a rider and with reins, he can direct the whole large animal any way that he wants it to go. In the same way, a very large ship is directed and steered by a very small rudder in the back by the pilot of the ship. And so both of these illustrations are positive. It's a good thing to guide a horse with this bit in its mouth. It's a good thing to send a ship where it should go by this small rudder in the back. And so when the tongue is controlled, the body will go in the right direction, even though the tongue is quite small. And James goes on to say in verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And so the tongue is small. It can be used constructively to steer the body and our lives in the right direction, but it also can boast of great things. Boasting is associated with pride. Prideful people speak boastful words. Those who boast are doing, that they're doing great things are sinning, and they often cause harm and they put others down with their bows. And so we see in this introduction in the very first section of James chapter 3 the need to control our speech, the importance of controlling our speech because if we can control our speech then we can control the rest of our lives or God will have control of the rest of our lives as well. When our words are out of control then our words become destructive. 
And so throughout this chapter, we're going to see the need for discipline in our speech. One of the fruit of the Spirit that we've been talking about on Sunday mornings with the children is the fruit of self-control. And that fruit comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit can work that fruit of self-control, which particularly applies to our words in our speech. Because, you see, our words can either be righteous or unrighteous. They can be holy or they can be sinful. Now, much of James chapter 3 deals with avoiding sinful speech. And the Bible has a lot to say about what kinds of speech to avoid. The view that words don't really matter, what we say isn't that important, is simply not true. Ephesians 5, 4 says, Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. And so for the believer, swearing, using vulgar terms or slang, crude jokes of any kind, or even just foolish speech is not appropriate. Not only does this speech reflect poorly on us as believers, not only does it detract from our witness, it also negatively influences others. This verse also indicates that this type of sinful speech is wrong not only in itself, but rather than using our tongue in that way, that destructive way, we should be using our tongue in a positive way of giving thanks to God. So if we want to exercise more self-control in our speech, what can we do? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that we have a problem with our speech. Now, according to James, nobody is exempt. We all have issues with our speech. We could all use some improvement. If you're not sure what types of speech you may need to change, well, if you're married, ask your spouse. If you're not, ask a friend that you spend time with and talk to a lot, and I'm sure they can identify some issues with your speech. And once we identify the issues with our words and we see some of the things that we need to change, we need to repent. We need to admit that it's sin, and we need to ask God for forgiveness and ask Him to help us. Now, changing our speech is not just a matter of Stopping saying certain words. It's a matter of replacing the ungodly words with godly words. The words that God would have us speak. We also need to pay attention to the words that we are listening to. Whether from friends, workmates, things we read, things we watch, things we listen to. If you constantly listen to ungodly speech, you are definitely going to have problems with your own speech. But with God's help, you can grow in controlling your speech. Now, in case we haven't realized how important controlling our tongues is, God wants us to understand the incredibly destructive power of words. And that's how James continues, beginning in the second part of verse 5. He says, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. And so James now likens the tongue and the words that we speak as, as sparks. A spark has two characteristics. First of all, it's, it's very small, but it can create an enormous forest fire. And secondly, once a spark ignites a fire, it's very difficult to put out. It just, it just has a mind of its own. It just keeps going and spreading. And so two words that are spoken are almost impossible to retrieve or to reel back in. Their impact on others can be enormously destructive. The tongue can not only impact others, the words can impact us. They can corrupt us. They can stain, it says, our whole body of someone who has not learned to Tame their tongue. The destructive words of a tongue can, can ruin an entire life. And what is the origin of the tongue's evil power? Well, James tells us the power of the tongue can be set on fire by hell and Satan himself. And he is the father of lies. He is the master of ungodly speech. And so when we are seeking to control our speech, we are actually battling the hosts of hell. 
James goes on to say in verse 7, For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Human beings have tamed all kinds of wild animals. Lions have been tamed and they appear in, in circuses and zoos. But James says that no person can tame their own tongue. The poison of an untamed tongue can spread death to those who hear its words. Now, if no human being can tame the tongue, how can we have hope? Well, again, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. To have self-control of your tongue is to tame the tongue. And that doesn't happen in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. He can change us. We'll talk about more from the inside out, from our hearts. Verse 9, James goes on to say, With it, that is our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And so now James turns, I believe, to an example of what was going on in the churches that he was writing to. People would come to church. They would praise God. They would worship together. They would bless God together. But during the week, they would curse other people who had offended them, whether believer or unbeliever. And James reminds us, and he reminds the churches he was writing to, that every person has been created in the image of God. And to curse another person, many people would not think of cursing God. But to curse another person who is made in the image of God is, in effect, cursing God as well, which is sin. And not only is that sin in and of itself, it shows there's something wrong in the heart of a person who both blesses God on one hand and curses people on the other. What we speak reflects what is in our hearts. James says in verse 11, some more examples. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And so James here gives, gives three different examples of what he called double-mindedness in James chapter 1. Can a spring produce a stream of fresh water and a stream of salt water at the same time? And the answer obviously is no. It's, it's impossible because a stream can only produce one result, which is what its nature is. And the same is true of James' other examples. The point is that a heart of a believer should not produce speech that both blesses God on one hand and curses people on the other. There's something wrong with a double-speaking heart that needs repentance and needs the work of the Holy Spirit to make that heart pure once again. Notice that James is referring to his fellow believers as, as my brothers, indicating that there are believers. This is not written to the world. This is written to believers in churches in James' day, that they need to adjust their hearts and their speech habits to be more godly. And so, we need to understand the importance of our speech and the destructiveness that it can bring. You know, a common saying about speech is that sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. From our study today, is that statement true or false? Well, it's false. Words have incredible destructive power. Words can hurt people. They can destroy lives. They can destroy families. They can destroy churches and even nations. So what other kinds of poisonous words can, can hurt people? Well, calling people negative names. Our society today seems everybody is calling somebody else some type of negative name. Gossiping about others, lying, breaking promises, being overly critical, discouraging others, and the list could go on and on. Now, all of our speech doesn't have to be just happy-go-lucky. I mean, there is a place for godly rebuke or correction, but that all should be done in love as well, speaking the truth in love. Words can hurt people, and we all do it from time to time, especially to those we are closest to. And we mustn't dismiss our words with an excuse like, well, I really, 
I really didn't mean to say that. You know, hurtful words come from sin in our hearts. They don't just pop out of us. They come from something that's wrong inside of us. They're always the result of, of negative thoughts. The thought comes first, and that comes from our heart, and then we speak the words. And so we need to ask for forgiveness from God for those words and from the other person. And ask God to help, uh, help you to think positive things about others, to pray for others. And as your thoughts become more godly, as your thoughts become more encouraging, as you begin to pray more and more for others, rather than criticizing them, you're going to grow in taming your tongue. You're going to grow in godly speech. Understanding the destructive power of speech. And finally, James speaks to us and tells us to speak with wisdom, to speak wisely. Verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So in the final section of James chapter 3, the topic shifts to wisdom. Wisdom will express itself in godly speech. If somebody thinks that he's a wise person, then that wisdom will be de demonstrated in his works, which certainly includes his speech. Now remember that James previously spoke negatively of the tongue boasting, and here he speaks of meekness or the humility of godly wisdom. And that will express itself not in prideful boasting, but in wise, helpful speech. He says in verse 14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition where? In your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. And so now James turns to the root of ungodly speech. We see it's in the heart. And these two examples from the heart that he gives are jealousy and selfish ambition. Both are sinful. The result of, of prideful boasting and lying are certainly destructive. James tells us in verse 15, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. And so James shows us the origin of the sin that begins in our heart and then is expressed in our tongue. It certainly does not come from heaven, but it is demonic, coming from Satan and his demons as they tempt us, as they influence us to speak the words he would have us to speak rather than the words God has for us to speak. And James takes us further to show the results of this type of ungodly speech. In verse 16, he says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Now we need to remember here that James' concern is not with sinful behavior of people outside in the church in the world, those who are unbelievers. He is concerned with sinful behavior within the churches. Can there be jealousy and selfish ambition Within a church? Or between churches? Well, absolutely yes. And what are the results of such attitudes? What are the results of that speech that comes from a heart with those attitudes? Well, this verse tells us they're going to result in disorder and every vile practice. So all kinds of bad things can happen through our words. Families, churches. Even businesses can be harmed or destroyed when this type of demonic wisdom is allowed and practiced and spoken. James then concludes in verse 17. He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So having spent most of this chapter on the destructive aspects of the tongue, the chapter ends with the positive. He describes godly wisdom, which results in godly speech with a series of positive adjectives. And all of these adjectives can be used to describe the words that we use, to describe godly words. A tongue that is tamed, a tongue that is under God's control, under the Spirit's control, will speak pure words, not impure words. We'll speak gentle words, not angry words. We'll speak reasonable words, not unreasonable words. We'll speak merciful words, sincere words, words that don't show partiality or don't discriminate against people. And the fruit of godly speech will be 
good fruit. The final sentence of the chapter speaks of a harvest of righteousness that comes from peacemakers. You see, ungodly words of any kind produce conflict between people. They produce disorder, division. They promote evil. But godly words spoken with God's wisdom bring healing, bring peace, and build relationships. And so we must grow in speaking wisely. You know, in today's world, ungodly speech is everywhere. And I believe it's growing worse every year, perhaps even month by month. Ungodly words are demonic in their origin. They fuel hatred and division between people. And we have a lot of that in our country today. And these negative words reveal the hearts of the people who use them. They reveal the sin that's in their hearts. Now, sometimes we excuse using ungodly words by saying, oh, oh, that just slipped out. I, I didn't mean to say that. Well, if we use that kind of excuse, we have now just compounded our sin by lying. Ungodly words come from sin in our hearts. And we are responsible, God's word tells us, for every word that we speak. And so we need to own up if we speak words that are unkind. We need to own up to it. We need to repent of it both to God and ask for forgiveness from Him and from others as well. To speak with godly wisdom requires courage, as those who speak with godly wisdom are and will be in the minority today. As believers, God calls us to be leaders for Him. Leaders do not give in to peer pressure. Leaders do not care about what other people think. Leaders follow God first and foremost. Leaders speak what God tells them to speak. They say the right things, even though everybody around them is saying the wrong things. They're not afraid to stand out. They're not afraid to be ridiculed. Quite frankly, unwise speech is part of many believers' vocabulary. And so first of all, we need to look at our own hearts and learn to tame our own tongues and then we can speak the truth in love to others, both by example and helping them to speak wisely as well. And so today we've learned about taming the tongue. A tame tongue not only doesn't speak the wrong things, it also speaks the right things, the, God, the things that God would have us to speak. Now we can't learn to control our speech by sheer willpower. Much of our speech patterns are habitual. We, we sometimes don't even realize why we say what we do, we repeat it so often. We need the Spirit's help to develop new godly speech patterns. Part of learning to change in the use of our words is to, is to realize the destructive power of words and not think, oh, they have no meaning. Oh, that wasn't such a big thing. It's just some words. But God wants us to use our words. Not to advance evil. Not to influence people in the wrong direction but to speak His wisdom into every situation. Do you want to know what godly speech looks like? Well, the Bible is filled with God's Word. God's Word is, by definition, godly speech. That is how we should be talking. Now, we don't have to be quoting Scripture and everything we say and do, but that is the example of how we should speak. Speak. Look at how Jesus addressed situations. Look at how he addressed people and seek to follow his example. Make a decision to be a leader in your speech, not afraid to be different. And as, as we do that, God will help us to be peacemakers and influence a lost world for him. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to, to repent, to become a believer if you've never done so before, if you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, I'd encourage you to pray along with me. We're going to, I'm going to encourage you to do three things that the Bible teaches are, are essential to becoming a follower of, of Christ Jesus. First of all, admit that you've done wrong things, that you've sinned. And we all can think of things where we've said wrong things. Those are sins that we need to admit and repent and turn away from. We need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, that our sins might be, the penalty for our sins might be paid for. Ask Him for forgiveness. Believe that He rose from the dead three days later and commit your life to following Him 
as your Lord and Savior. So let's pray together right now. Perhaps you prayed a prayer like this in the past, but you've drifted away and you want to recommit your life to the Lord this morning. I'd encourage you to pray along with me as well. Say something like this. Father, today, I admit that I've sinned, I've done wrong things, and I repent. I, I turn away from those words that I've spoken that are wrong, actions I've done that are wrong. And I ask for you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, paid the penalty for my sins that I might be forgiven. Come into my life. I believe you rose from the dead and are alive today. And I commit myself to following you and your word all the days of my life. For those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, this morning we thank you for giving us the ability to communicate your truth with our words. We ask for your forgiveness for the many times when, when our words have been ungodly and have not advanced your kingdom. We repent of our words that have caused pain and have influenced people not towards you but towards evil. Help us to understand the great power of our tongues, whether for evil or for good. We want to speak with godly wisdom. We want to speak with your love in every opportunity or situation that you bring into our lives. Purify our hearts and minds so that the source of our speech would be filled with your word and would come out with godly wisdom in our speech. Thank you, God, for helping us to speak more and more like Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you made a commitment to Jesus Christ and would like more information, I'd encourage you to connect with us. There should be a link below the video that you're watching. And uh, you click that link and you'll connect with us and we'll be able to pray for you and offer you some helpful materials. You can find more information, other ways to contact us on our, on our website, lifechurchstlouis.org. Our Sunday morning services are open, have been open for some time at 10 a.m., we are located at 15036 Clayton Road in Chesterfield. We invite you to come and worship with us this Sunday if you live in the St. Louis area. Next Sunday, we're going to be continuing in our message series, Life Lessons from the Book of James with a message entitled, Resist the Devil. Online donations to help us reach more people for Jesus Christ are available at lifechurchstlouis.org slash give, uh, and you can give online that way. So God bless you. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.